This is the True Voice Media Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Gibbard. Back in 2011, I started a social business agency called True Voice Media. In 2013, I launched this podcast because my audience told me that they wanted to learn more about how social media could help them grow their business, but they wanted it to be interesting and without all the standard social media hype and BS, just someone who would give it to them straight with honest, simple strategies that they can use today. If you're a new listener and that sounds like what you want to, listen to this episode. And if you love it, subscribe to our show. We'd love to have you on board. So without further ado, let's get started. This is episode 41. We are now squarely into our 40s, and I have... And I'm just getting like the best guests lately. I'm like really, I am on a tear. I have got Ron Tight from the Tight Group, uh, who is another gentleman that I'm a part of this kick-ass Facebook group um, that is totally secret, so I won't even mention it by name. But I've been able to get some incredible people delivering incredible insights. Ron, do me a favor, tell everybody who you are and what you do. My name is Voldemort. Ah, I cannot so be good. named. <laughs> um, yeah, it's the, it's the secrecy of the group. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Ron Tight, and I'm the uh, president and uh, – or sorry, I'm the founder and CEO of The Tight Group. And we're a content marketing agency uh, based in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And, uh, I think it's yeah, pronounced Canada. I think that – Cana- Yeah, I think the emphasis the- is on a different syllable. It's the French. That's the French pronunciation. So I'm very impressed with how bilingual you are. Um, and yeah, we're, we're the uh, we're the content marketing agency for people like Microsoft and Johnson and Johnson and AB World Foods and uh, and Johnson Insurance and people like that. And um, uh, in addition to that, I guess I'm a you know I'm executive producer and host of a comedy show called Monkey Toast. Uh, I'm a soon to be uh, or an author with a um, a book coming out in the spring with Harper Collins. Uh, and a speaker who does uh, well. Twenty fifteen is just wrapping up. I did sixty five speaking engagements this year. Uh, it was a very busy year. So as I'm like, as we're you know right before the holidays, I'm crawling towards the holiday season. Uh, but it's a uh, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot going on. That is kick ass. So the, I guess my first question before we get into to anything too deep, but when you saw a company called the Tight Group and you applied. Was it just kind of one of these natural fits where you thought, okay, there's the tight group, my last name is tight, maybe just on that alone? Or did, did they put you through the ringer before you got to do that? I, I only work with organizations with double entendres in their, uh, in their name. And, uh, yeah, you know, it was, it's, what's really funny about that is I, I th- when I started the agency, people were – the first thing people ask is like, what's it going to be called? You know, like it's this big creative exercise that, that, that some people take months and they, they brainstorm a million different names. And I, I always kind of go back to this, this thought that IBM stands for International Business Machines and they don't sell business machines anymore. So it doesn't really matter, folks. Like, you know, uh, and I thought agency names were just getting way too wacky and creative for the creative sake. And, and so I just – I spent – literally two seconds on it and said we're calling it the tight group now let's focus on building the business opposed to naming the business wow that is extremely practical where do you come from <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and, and i was a creative director too you know i was executive creative director and that's where people were like this is going to be where i'm going to show my creative prowess and the name that i come up with and i'm like eh, it's a tight group that works let's move on yeah <laughs> So that, I guess, set the tone for the uh, the level of creativity that you were going to bring to it, I suppose. Yeah, well, I just – I thought that we had to – you know, that great ideas just they didn't need the wrapping all the – they didn't always need the wrapping. Sometimes you do, but in this case, it was like it's more important that we have a business to talk about. Well, yeah, I like that about – you know, I've watched some of your talks and, and they're very straightforward, no BS, and, and the examples that you give are great, um, which the first thing that came to mind after I was watching some of these examples are where do you find these? Because, you know, I mean on the one hand, you could just search for a brand name, and but you, some of the examples that you pulled up were so freaking funny, um, which actually it should be mentioned for those listening that Ron – correct me if I'm wrong, but you are Second City trained, correct? 
Yeah, I was never a uh, main stage Second City Toronto, uh, but I was uh, trained in Second City. I was on the corporate roster for, jeez, uh, probably a decade. And uh, and the show I currently host is with, you know, c- kind of a lot of Second City alumni. So we're kind of, I've always been loosely affiliated, but I was never a main stage guy. But yeah, I mean, that that's a um, such a wonderful uh, place to train you know, from a comedy, you know, how musicians go and you got to take piano. Yep. It's like you just got to start taking piano. I think comedians got to start doing improv, and I think a lot of business people should start doing improv. It's a, a great skill to have. Even though I became a stand-up, I was never really a great improviser. So I think that also, you know, a lot of speakers, and and you see this especially with um, Michael Port's whole perspective, which I know you're involved with, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But it, yeah. you know, looking at it as a performance, and you know, the I think there's a lot to be said for um, keynote presenters who have some background in either improv, stand-up comedy, or something like that. I, even at the very least, Toastmasters. Um, so you know, your background in that I'm sure has contributed to your your success as a speaker. I assume you you would agree with that. A hundred percent. I mean, I did a, 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 you know, before I started officially formally speaking, I was doing corporate comedy and where I, you know, I like I'd go in and I'd listen to, uh, you know, a bunch of speakers in the day and then I'd write a customized set and deliver it at nighttime. And, um, you know, there's this line by Woody Allen that comedy always sits at the kids table. And um, so I was like, hmm, I'm not making as much as the other people around here and it doesn't really scale well. So I'm going to stop selling myself as a comedian and I'm going to start selling myself as a speaker who just happens to be funny and because um, speakers are valued way more than comedians are. And so I, and then that has given me an advantage, I think, because I know how to read a room. Um, I can improvise on the spot. Um, I, I know the role that humor plays in, in speaking. I can connect with people. I know about customizing stuff for specific on all those things that timing. help to speak rep. T- yeah, timing is yeah, <laughs> kind of a big of, thing. It's kind of a big thing. Um, and uh, so that is – it has certainly helped on the speaking side. So stand-up was more your thing. So if, if – more than improv. So I was thinking if, if at any point our podcast slowed to a crawl, I was just going to say yes and and see where you took it. <laughs> yeah, I, that's when I fall to the ground and start searching for a lost eye contact or something. Uh, <laughs> Fair points. Yeah, but yeah, I was always a, I always loved the craft of stand up uh, as an art form, and um, and uh, so it was a touring stand up for years. Cool. Well, before I want to get into what you're doing with content marketing, and I, I especially want to touch on this thing that you're calling the expression economy. Um, but before we do that, can you just tell me a little bit about what you're doing with Michael Port and um, the the whole event that's going on down in Florida? Yeah. So we're we're doing uh, Michael's event is um, from what I from what I hear from him, and I was talking talking with Scott Stratton who did a session last year and uh, just a great event where Michael brings in some great speakers to help people who just want to get better at speaking but really takes this artistic side of things so like what can a choreographer you know what what perspective do they have on a talk and and um, and uh, you know and what about an actor what about the, the performance side of acting and how does that help speaking and so I'm bringing the comedy perspective not I think this is the way people what they normally think is oh so you're going to talk about how I should be funny in my speech and there's a there's an element to that that because humor is really powerful but I think more importantly is what can you learn about the process that a comedian uses to develop material and to perform material and if you happen to, if you can work, make that funny, then great, it's going to help you out. But it doesn't have to be funny. You can be, you know, that process can lead you to a place where it's a really great insight uh, opposed to a, a hilarious punchline and you'll be just as effective. Can you give any preview of what that is or, or do we have to all attend the event to hear some of your insights on that? No, I can, uh, well, I guess uh, you'll have to ch- Check with Michael, and you may have to cut this from the final uh, show. So, so, so don't listeners. give away the whole. Don't give away the whole cow for free. Just give us, give us a little yeah. bit of it. I was going to say, so, so, listeners, if you hear a jump cut here, it's because Michael has not approved, um, and you don't want to piss off Michael Port. I mean, no, dude's you do got not. clout. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, there, you know, there's um, there's just a million different things there. I mean, everything from um, knowing your audience. Uh, you know, is absolutely critically important. 
and comedy because it's not just about um, gathering information, but we just we all love. There's nothing we like better than the sound of our own name, right? And and if you like motorcycle racing and I bring up motorcycle racing, you're going to connect with what I'm talking about in, in a much more effective way. So if I can get at the heart of what you like and what you think, and I can repackage some stuff for you that uses those insights, that uses those references, or adds my perspective to the thing you already care about, man, I'm, I'm way ahead. Uh, and, and it really just is about connecting with people. So, you know, it's things like that, about, that, about gathering those insights, um, reading the room and, and how do you read a room? Uh, how do you start a comedy set? Um, there, are, there are certain rules, you know, as a comedian, the first thing you want to do as a stand-up is you want to say, hey, how about a big hand for your host, folks? That's one of the first things you do, you learn in stand-up. And why do you do that? One, professional courtesy, because the host is, is setting you up. But the second thing is that you need an emotional response from the audience to silence the room. And I don't, I don't know if, if your kindergarten teacher did this, but sometimes you know, kindergarten teachers would go like, when the hand goes up, the mouth goes shut. Right? They get everybody to say that. And the reason they do that is because you get everybody joining in and – and then when it stops and there's absolute silence in the room, if there's any little murmuring, there, it's much more obvious. And so then those, per, those people go silent. Same thing in comedy. You want to go, big happy your host. And people go, ah. And then it stops. It dies down. It goes silent. And guess who's got the attention of the room? Got it. You that, do. That's fascinating because when I went to Michael Port's uh, event in New York and one of the things he did was he would put up his hand – and everybody would put up their hand and the room would go quiet. It was the way he got everybody's attention. So I'm wondering if that's from any sort of training he got or if that's because he used to be a kindergarten teacher. But it has to be <laughs> one of the two. I, I can accept no third option. Yes. When he, when he says pull out your finger paints, you know what the answer is. Oh, he did that. So Okay. So I guess we're clear on this now. He was a kindergarten teacher. Yeah. Thanks, um, Mr. Port. <laughs> Have you ever gotten a heckler in one of your – not in one of your comedy shows, but in one of your speaking engagements? you ever get somebody who would chime in too much? Yeah, you get people who uh, – you can – well, in comedy we have – well, what I, uh, how I've defined it, there are, two, there are two types of hecklers. There's the passive heckler and the active heckler. And you get the exact same thing in business. So the active heckler is a person who is paying attention. They're listening to what you say. They're forming an opinion. And they're voicing that opinion. Usually in a comedy club, it's, you know, you suck. And, um, and, and, and in business, it's that person who goes like, I don't agree with that or I think you're wrong or I want to challenge your, your data or, you know, whatever. Um, in, uh, in comedy, the passive heckler is, the, is, is actually a worse kind of heckler. It's the, the person who doesn't even know you're on stage. It's the person who's talking to the person beside them. They're not paying attention. They're not looking at you. They're just not engaged. And and then they're going to leave. And they're going to go, oh, that show kind of sucked. Well, because they weren't engaged off the top. And in business, the exact same thing. If you're doing a talk or you're in a meeting, it's the person who you can see it on their face and they're not saying anything. And they're going to walk away. And if it's in a boardroom, they're going to kill your idea in the hallway even though they didn't say anything in the, in the boardroom. And if it's in a speech, they're going to leave way. And those are the people that give you the one out of 10 on your performance review or on your, on your evaluation form. So in, in both cases, you, you have to engage the person. So in a speech, if I see somebody, I'm like, man, this person is not loving what I'm saying or they're disagreeing with it. I'll go, I'll start by looking at them, making direct eye contact and going, you with me on this? Right? Like as a little humorous kind of, right, Billy? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And if I, and then if I get a smile, I'm like, oh, okay, maybe they're just in a weird mood. But if they don't budge or I see some other bodily reactions, um, then I go, you seem to think this is BS. Let's talk about it. And, um, and, and it gives you an opportunity to address the thing that maybe some other people are thinking. And um, I, I, well, I'll, what I'll also do is if I pick up on that, I'll start putting caveats in some of the things I say. Because as a speaker, it's really easy to stand up on stage and go, that's right, be authentic. 
right? It's, and we all kind of say that sort of thing. And I think it is. Imp- I think it really is important. Yeah, it's a tough part. The, the the vernacular is the same whether you're a total you know bullshit artist or whether you're you're you know a legit professional in it because a lot of the concepts are the same. It's just a matter about how much deeper you can go on it. So you know, I definitely I can appreciate that point. Yeah, and there you know, there's a, a so there's an example I've been using lately because I know it's really easy for a speaker to get up and goes you know hey you got to embrace your own personality and be your true unique self. And, um, and, uh, and I, but I will also say, I go, look here, but here's the reality with it. I know it's not always possible. It's really easy for me to say, I know it's not always possible. And I'm just as much, I'm just as guilty. So I just, I signed a TV deal earlier this year with Mark Burnett and to be on this new, uh, business reality show and, uh, called Dream Funded. And it's a deal between C- CTV in Canada and I think Fox in the U S or something. Um, uh, or sorry, it was ABC in the U.S. originally, and something came came through, and they said, um, "You can't really." Well, your your podcast listeners certainly can't see it, um, but I have a diastema, a, a a gap between two teeth, a David Letterman type gap in between. It's not in the middle, but it's just off to the side. It's a little bit of a gap. And ABC came back and said, "Fix the teeth. <laughs> it's just a little bit distracting." And I, my initial reaction was, I'm not fixing the teeth. Forget those guys. Like, this is me. I've consciously not fixed it my entire life. No, the gap is to me. I've always had it. I'm not doing it. And then I came home to my wife. <laughs> and my wife said, do not mess this up. This is a great opportunity. Fix the teeth. It's $1,000 and 10 minutes of your time. Suck it up. And so here I was, I can't go, hey, always embrace your unique personality and, you know, never give up. And a principle is only a principle when it costs you money and have a backbone. And then kind of go, oh, OK, I'll, fi- I'll fix the teeth. Yeah. So you have to put that out there to go, hey, no, it's not always perfect. And I'm just as guilty as all of you. But at least we should aspire to always doing it. Well, let's run with the authenticity thing for a little bit because it, I, it's something I've heard you talk about a number of times. And I know that content marketing is really like the, the centerpiece of a lot of what your agency does. And this idea of authenticity and content, I found very difficult to get across the goal line with a lot of early in clients where these are clients that don't currently have any content strategy and the content that they're putting out is minimal at best. And we're just trying to get them up and running on some sort of um, – a schedule where they're putting content out and touching their prospects or clients or, or whoever regularly. How do you make the case that authenticity is important from the get-go, or do you think it's something that can happen later on down the road without consequence, and you just start by building something to just get the wheels kind of turning? Yeah, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy because you're not only dealing with brand managers and and direct of marketing and whatnot who are part of an entire ecosystem that has uh, been perfected over, you know, 50 years of a way of doing things. And um, so one person may get it, but when they go to their boss and go, we're going to do this, you know, it's just so much easier not to be authentic. It's really easy to just use a bunch of jargon to, you know, say things in a really polished way with no personality and the reason it's really easy because I, I think the power of authenticity is in imperfection that true authenticity is being comfortable with your imperfection so for me to have a gap in my teeth is me being really authentic it's a piece that's in that's it's not perfect um, or a weird voice or or a, a bad clothing style or what it, whatever the heck it is or if you're Donald Trump your hair or your New Jersey mob accent you know those things are imperfections but they're the things that make you real and so to tell a brand manager that you're not only going to you know accept the imperfections but you're going to highlight them that doesn't go over well and in the end, it you know what, what the case we try to make is: look, don't think of off. We're not just doing it for the sake of being authentic, so we can check that box. We're doing it because when you're authentic, people trust you. And in and I know we'll get to this in a little bit, but in in what we call the expression economy, in this it's a battle for time. And what do people want in the battle for time? They want easy decisions. They want people. They want brands. They want companies that they can trust. Because if I trust you then I don't have to do the research. I don't have to check around. I doesn't have to always be on the top of my mind. Do I have to check back with you as if I'm sure it's going to work? I trust you. 
And when you come forward with those imperfections and you embrace those imperfections and you not try to be something you're not, it helps deliver trust, makes my relationship with you based in trust. And now I don't have to worry about it. I can continue to buy your product because I trust you. I'm not always kind of going back going, I don't know. Am I being hosed here? Like, do I trust these people? Um, Nobody wants to have any relationship like that. So one of the big challenges professionals in this space uh, come across, and, and I'm sure you've come across it too, and, and I think sometimes it's the appropriate question, sometimes it's not, but it's this question of ROI. You know, What's the return on investment of doing a particular thing? And when we come to the question of authenticity, it can be very difficult to pinpoint a statistic that says being authentic leads to this much of a lift in brand awareness, lead generation, and sales. But I, I think if what I'm hearing from you is correct, the premise is somewhat along the lines of – if you allow yourself to be authentic and, and slightly imperfect, it, it allows you to be human, which is easier to connect to, which will give people the opportunity to trust you. And when they trust you, they're more likely to give you that attention, which is limited. There's a limited window and lots of inputs. And when you're getting that visibility, you at least have the chance that if they see you and they trust you and they're in the position to make that decision, that there's the opportunity for you to get a sale. And while that may not be measurable, that's kind of the flow of what you're saying, I assume. One hundred percent. And I, I, you know, this is what the skeptics right now. I know there are listeners out there right now. This oh yeah. Is what they're saying they're going. I don't want my soda cracker to be a person. And I get that. I get that we don't have to we always treat it that way. That your soda cracker doesn't have to crack jokes and and and, and all of that. May, I mean, maybe depending on the brand. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying just be real and be honest and and be authentic and. Um, and at, on some level, I think it's it's kind of been blown out of proportion in some cases where, yeah, people are now tr- trying to make their brands be like a rebel rocker or, who, you know, whatever. Um, I don't know that, that people place that much importance in uh, most of the brands we consume. Most of the brands we consume are kind of commodity stuff. They're like, eh, it's unspecial. Sure, looks good. You know, um, but man... When you're at shelf and you see two crackers that are the same price with kind of the same approach, are you are you not going to choose the one that you kind of like? I don't know. I think you are. And I don't know that I'm going to be able to pinpoint the data on that. And I don't know that we have time to yeah, do that. I, I completely agree. And the thing I always come back to is that prior to all of this – online technology where we had trackable links and we had all these different campaigns we could run against one another with conversion tracking and all of that, we basically said, well, we're going to run a print ad and we're going to hope to see a lift in sales. And there's absolutely no idea what worked and what didn't work. Um, so now that we have all this measurability, all of a sudden everything comes under that same kind of scrutiny. So it, it is kind of amazing that that's how it goes down. Yeah. it's And uh, people, like I used to work on Dell business and I was the creative director on the Dell business and you know everything was down to a cost per lead cost per phone call and so we have to run a print ad and you know if it had a color headline it delivered at x dollars cost per cost per call and blah, blah, whatever and so everything was so data driven that there was no emotion in it right because it's like oh well what's the emotion what's what does that deliver what is it delivered <laughs> is, is kind of long term value and and if you if you're going to have a 699 desktop and you're like, wow, that delivers at a really great cost per call, it's wonderful until someone comes out with the 599 desktop and you're done. Because if you're just going to act on data and then and, and on commodity prices, as soon as somebody can, can produce it cheaper, you're dead because there's no emotional connection. There's no reason to come back. It's it's kind of like the – remember that scene from uh, Something About Mary and um, when um, – uh, ben Stiller picks up the, the the hitchhiker, and it's Harlan Williams, who's a great stand-up comedian. He picks up the hitchhiker, and, and he's like, "Hey, man, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna have you heard of the eight-minute abs? Well, I'm gonna come up with something in the seven-minute abs. You know, that's what I'm gonna do." And Ben Stiller goes, "Yeah, but w- what about what, what happens when someone comes out with the six-minute abs?" And he's like, "Dude, you can't get a good workout in six minutes." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, I think about that a lot when it's when it comes to competing on price. And you know, now that we're competing on so many other factors and we have so many inputs and we're trying to make decisions about what to pay attention to and now we have way more networks to pay attention to and all this crap, where does where does this idea of the expression uh, economy come in? Tell us about that. 
Yeah, the expression economy is, and I know there's the sharing economy, and the, <laughs> there's, it's, this is the latest from the people who bought you the sharing economy and the noble economy comes the expression. in a world where there are multiple economies coming at yeah. once. <laughs> the expression yeah, economy by the tight one group economy. Yeah, this is just the notion that um, you know th- three things happened. I think over the last little while that are really important to what brands do to how brands connect with people to how you and I connect with one another and how maybe you connect with your spouse or your family, whatever. Uh, the first thing is the cost of production came down drastically. So if, before, if you wanted to make a TV show, you, you needed to be NBC. You need to be universal. You know, you need to big studios and cameras and editors and makeup people and triple scale talent and all that. Um, and then overnight, the cost of production came down to the point that you and I can shoot and cut a TV show with the phone in our pocket. Uh, so that's the first thing that happened, which is not, this is, this is nothing new. The, the listeners right now are going, what? This is, I've heard this before. So yeah, cost of production comes down. Second thing, we got massive distribution, right? Uh, of, of the internet. But now when you combine the really low cost of production with massive and instantaneous global distribution, what you end up with is the third thing that nobody's talking about. And this is a desire to create and consume niche content. So again, if, I mean, uh, you know, if you're really into motorcycles and, and 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 pink motorcycles, well, in the past there were six people in your neighborhood that you could talk to about this, and there was one magazine. Well, now you can geek out twenty four seven. Uh, on the thing you love on pink motorcycles because there's a podcast about it and there's 500 Twitters, uh, people on Twitter that are talking about pink motorcycles and, and there's a mag- there's an e-magazine and there's e-books and there's Twitter chats and so the thing you love more than anything in the world you can geek out on 24-7. So this and, is the long tail you're talking about basically is that the, the proliferation of these niche communities popping up gave every freaking geek their own community to be a part of. Yeah, and, and I think what we're but what we're failing to address, because I think everyone has talked about that, right? Yes, you can shoot a TV show. Everybody can do it. And everyone's a photographer on Instagram. It's like, yeah, that's all true. But the, the, the result of that is that I can geek out on the stuff I absolutely love. And the stuff that I don't love, i.e. traditional media, direct mail pieces, uh, people I don't maybe want to engage in conversation with, all that stuff is now just battle for time and there's just way better stuff out there like I'm a baseball freak if if you talk to me do I want to talk to somebody about my insurance or do I want to listen to a baseball podcast it's baseball and and so this battle for time is absolutely huge because there's we're just competing against the internet and there's a lot of, can, there, can I swear on this podcast of course go right ahead there's a lot of great shit out there and it, and if I don't care if you're if you're pitching a product, if you're running a TV spot, if you're trying to connect with your wife, you better be better than the stuff that she has access to on her phone, because you're dead in the water. So the the line we use is people used to vote with their wallets, now they vote with their time. And if you can't win the battle for time, good luck. So go ahead with your five ninety nine, you know, whatever your commodity price is and everything else. Good luck cutting through on that because I got a baseball podcast I got to listen to. Well, let me ask you this because I, you know, I just to, I don't want to say push back on it, but just to kind of frame a different side of it. Yeah, we opened up the channels of distribution, and now anybody could find the thing that they're interested in. But I think what we're seeing now is that because there's so much out there, the channels that serve up this content are starting to squeeze off the flow a little bit. If you look at the Facebook algorithm, and, and you know, let's say you started a Facebook page six years ago about pink motorcycles, that Facebook page might have acquired an audience that now you can't organically reach. So then you have to move elsewhere. So you constantly have to either be migrating your audience or you have to begin to move back into – the same sort of direction it was prior to all of this technology. Does that? Do you think that's going to fundamentally change these things, or are we just going to keep kind of popping up elsewhere like whack-a-mole? Yeah, that's a, a great metaphor. Of, yeah, it is. It is whack-a-mole. You're 100 percent right in that the the world of work, and certainly in Facebook, is dominating the kind of content distribution conversation, and the organic uh, content, organic reach is is dead, and now. We're a content marketing agency, and I always said, oh, it's because we don't do ads. It's like, oh, we amplify Facebook posts, which so it's now an ad. Oh, yeah, we're definitely going to come back to – I want to talk about the changing nature of advertising, but c- continue to make your point, but we're going to come back to that. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, uh, so yes, the, the distribution of the content is changing. I think what 
because it's a battle for time, uh, what we're actually going to see more and more is we're just going to see better ba- gatekeepers. So, you know, if you look at music in the, in the um, bef- pre-internet, who were the gatekeepers? It was the labels. The label said, there's a million bands out there. Don't worry about it. You don't have to see them all. We're going to go out. We're going to tour around in dingy bars. We're going to sign the best ones. And best labels and labels begin to know for the type of music. And they're like, you don't have to worry about it. We're going to do the work for you. And it's all out there. Um, and, um, and, and, uh, and then we came up with this thing. We're like, oh, my God, we can just have access to every single band in the world. This is amazing. And six months later, we're like, this, these bands suck. There's a lot of bands that suck out there. And can someone just help me find the really good stuff? So I think, you know, we will, I think we will still connect to communities. I think, though, we're going to connect to gatekeepers who do a lot of that work for us. But the stuff that they're finding, they still have to kind of go through the rubble and the, and the you know, the bargain bin to see what's worth really finding. And I think other stuff you're going to see um, that's just going to bubble up. You know, there was a great interview with Dave Grohl that um, I just saw last week. And I was like, you know, what should a band do? And it's like, you know what? They should just get out and play it live. Like, if you just forget everything else, if you're just, if you're good enough, people are going to find you. What we're finding now is people who think that they can write a book just because they have access to Microsoft Word. Yep. And that's not true. That just because you have YouTube that you can shoot a TV show, that's great. You can shoot a TV show, but you still need to know character arcs and stories and shooting techniques and everything. Just because you can shoot it with your phone doesn't make it good, and shit is still going to be shit. Uh, I just think we're defining, redefining uh, what shit is. I think in the past we used to say it was production technique because the gatekeepers were the ones who put all those dollars in there. Now we're going... It can be amazing shot on your phone because it's not about the camera. But just because you shoot it on your phone doesn't mean it's going to be great either. Yeah, and, and I, I think I agree with your point. I, the one thing that I would kind of tweak about it is I would say I think we're moving from gatekeepers to tastemakers and influencers. So so to the idea is that you know nobody's stopping production in the, in the era of the gatekeepers where it was kind of like you only had access to what was allowed to be produced. Now anybody can produce, but to find the really good stuff, we're using either tastemakers, influencers, or algorithms to, to identify what those – I guess what those proper things are. But yeah, I'll, talk- agree. I'll, I'll agree with that, sure. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's James Vernack, it's the same idea, yeah. but um, yeah. uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about this shift in advertising because it's funny, when I started my company, I anytime, if somebody called me an advertising agency, like they might have well called me a Nazi. I was like, I, <laughs> don't you dare. Um, and now, I mean, at least 80% of the conversations I have with the client talks about well, you're going to have to put a paid budget on Facebook. You're going to have to put some money behind what you're doing on Twitter. And if you don't, then, I, I mean, honestly, we can't really do much for you because what kind of what's the point? Why put all this money into content if nobody's going to see it? So I do think that advertising has changed. Is it time for us to redefine advertising, or do you think that it's just an expanded definition from what it was? I think it is a transit. For the brands that do it right, it's a transition period. So we can't flip the switch on it, right? We can't go, all right, starting January 1st, 2016, we're now a content marketing disciplined brand. And, and we're not paying any more paid media, and that's it. You can't. You can't. You just can't do that. So you've got to slowly build your content generation over time, and the end goal being develop your own audience. Develop your core customers and the people that who you own that audience. You own the relationship. You own the contact information. You have the right to distribute interesting things to them. But brands don't own those audiences yet because they've been slow to move, and and it's that takes a lot of time. It changes roles within organizations. It changes process. It changes budgets. It changes everything. And so to go, you got to own, you know, develop your own audience and blow it into a CRM system and use that data to develop. Like, yeah, that's what you got to do over time. For now, though, we still got to move the, the, you know, we got 25 SKUs of this product. We got to move it off the shelf. So we, even if we're producing content, we still got to get people to consume that content. And we need some shortcuts. And advertising is an absolute shortcut. 
So whether it's a print ad that says you know dollar ninety nine off or a white paper that's amplified through Facebook, it's an ad. And we're using that content distribution mechanism to get interesting stuff in front of eyes that we don't own right now. But if we're smart about it, we'll use those relationships to develop our own audiences in five years' time. We don't have to pay Facebook and we don't have to pay NBC and we don't have to pay the Rolling Stone to do it. Um, will brands be able to make that switch? I don't know because it's pretty easy to write a check to Rolling Stone to run a print ad. And it's easy for the brand manager, and it's easy for the media company, and it's easy for the creative agency. Um, but to say we're going to write an article to an owned audience, that requires a journalist, and that requires planning, and that requires original photography. and that You know, it's just, it's really difficult. The good ones will get there. The bad ones will try and game the system, and they'll just cut the check. What is your feeling about sponsored content, native advertising, that entire world of blurred lines, is this paid and sponsored for or is this organic? What, what is your feeling on that? Because I, I noticed on your website a couple of those words cropped up here and there. I want to get a sense of like how you see that fitting in and whether that, uh, if there's any sort of ethical concerns about where that's, where it started, where it's going, the idea behind it. If there is a mantra, and I don't think we've we haven't we're working on a longer form piece right now that will that will distribute at some point in the new year. But if there is a mantra in 2016 for the world of content, it is this: the death of church and state. Church and state are dead. They're dead. We used to have the world of content that was I think I don't know if that was the church or the state, but let's call it the church. And then you had advertising that was a state, and those two worlds didn't cross over. And you know the newspapers and the broadcasters would always say, "Hey, you can go to YouTubers and you can go to Instagrammers and influencers and podcasters and bloggers. You know what we have? We have journalistic integrity. We have editorial credibility that we deliver in fact, and we do rigorous research and we fact check and all that kind of stuff. And that's the difference between us and those other guys." Well, what's happened, though, is that on the, the traditional content companies, they're losing their shirts. They're losing their shirts. They've got a, you know floors of six-figure salespeople who are part of their legacy system, and they're now competing against BuzzFeed. And, and BuzzFeed doesn't have those legacy systems, and the content they're com- creating is way more compelling. So they're creating crap for the masses. They've got legacy systems that have them paying people ridiculous salaries, t- and, and the cost of producing the th- – thing they've always needed all that advertising revenue for cost a fraction of the, of the money that it used to. So the, the, producing a magazine doesn't cost you what it used to. You don't need all those people. You don't need all that advertising revenue. And so you know they've been stuck kind of going, what do we do? And all the traditional publishers, all they've done is default to going, we got to become more digital. That's right. We're going to deliver web series or we're going to interrupt them with TV commercials. Um, it's dead. Because now they're they're being they're way more entrepreneurial with brands and with and I you know I hate when people are like well is it native advertising is like I don't care good shit is good shit people are going to consume stuff that they like and they don't care who paid for it and they don't care what channel it's on and they they just want good stuff and if it's good enough and Red Bull created it awesome if it's good enough and NBC created it awesome. Um, so I don't think we can use that excuse anymore. And we as consumers have to accept that, that good business for them actually means that um, they're, um, that they're, 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 it's the world of convergence. So, so another example, sorry. In, in, um, in uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the Yank, the, the, the broadcaster that owns the Yankees, uh, uh, or so NESN is a, a stake in uh, the Red Sox, right? Um, I think maybe I'm out of my league now. I only I know the create. Let me give you the Canadian reference. Okay. okay, good. Rogers Communications is a massive, massive company, and I respect them as a business. They own magazines. They have TV stations. They own a, a, a mobile phones. They have everything. They also own the Toronto Blue Jays. So if I'm Rogers, and I own a sports, it's called Sportsnet, is the network. I own a radio station called Sportsnet Fan 590. I own a magazine called Sportsnet Magazine. I own the Toronto Blue Jays, and I own the building that the Toronto Blue Jays play in. 
Now, if I've got a broadcast and it's the news and the top story is the Toronto Blue Jays, is that the top story because it's editorial credibility and it really should be the top story? Or is it the top story because if I put it in the top, more people will go watch Blue Jays games where I make additional and incremental revenue from? If I say, for more information on the story, go to our website, am, is that editorial credibility or am I driving them there because that's incremental revenue because there's more advertising dollars for the more viewers I get? Now, I'm not saying this because I'm a left-wing pinko who thinks this is wrong. I think it's right. I think it's great business. I just don't think we're using we're not using those terms. We say you guys can get away with that because it's editorial. But if you cut to a Johnson and Johnson commercial, well, that's advertising and that's additional revenue for another company. What's the difference? I don't know whether everything is content or whether everything is an ad. Um, it, even this podcast, right? Brought to you by Starbucks. <laughs> yeah, but the, you know, like. Like, this is amazing content. This is an absolutely lovely time. You're making money somewhere. I'm making money somewhere. Is this editorial credibility or is this just a content marketing piece because you and I are going to make a dough on a book sale or on a speaking gig or something? Again, I'm not saying it's evil. I think it's right and it's and it's great. We just have to uh, be transparent about it. So I think transparency is, is like really the big kind of underlying piece of that because if this were, for instance, being sponsored by Diet Coke or um, Contact as, which as if, I sip. Yeah, <laughs> as you sip, which I've heard you're a big fan of the Diet Coke. But for instance, if we just brought that up, the Diet Coke thing, and Diet Coke was sponsoring this, but we just casually brought it up a couple times, I think that undermines the credibility of our mentioning it in the first place. And I think it's that transparency where we need that dividing line. So I guess, you know, the, going back to the original question of it is the the kind of ethical considerations about how we label it and and you know I think um, who pays for it to your point if Red Bull makes something awesome people will just want awesome stuff right but I think people still want to know when it's being bought or when it's being reported on because it's interesting or or to your point your your Toronto Blue Jays story. If they were always saying, you know, the top story, Toronto Blue Jays, I think it would make sense if they were to say, you know, Rogers Communications owns these different things um, versus just throwing it in there and pretending as if it's it's always the top story. So I think it's that transparency and disclosure piece that I think is, is still kind of the fuzzy, murky waters because it looks like the sponsored text keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller and they're even using uh, fuzzy language like suggested well it's suggested because it was paid for yeah I, and I don't know I think in the old world you could draw that line right it was like it was black and white it's like content time or commercial time and that's it I, I just don't know where that I think the line is different for different people and for different publications and, and whatnot. Um, you know, like you bring up the Diet Coke example. There is a way, and, I'm, and I don't know how to do it, but there's a way for us, if this was paid for by Diet Coke, for us to do that in a way that the user goes, eh, good for them, I don't really care. Um, opposed to being sneaky about it. And uh, But I don't know that we need, need the line that says, and now we're cutting to commercial time. Yeah. You know, I think you can still do it. I just don't, it's not, it's not easy and it's a not a consistent. And you know who knows? The only people that know are the people who are listening. And if they go, ah, that felt slimy, then it didn't work and you crossed the line. Or if they go, eh, I don't really care, then it worked. And yeah. you did it in the right way. And I, and I think we as brands or, or uh, the brand managers there should feel comfortable kind of saying to their audiences, we don't know where the line is either. We just want to do the right thing. We don't want to trick you. We just want it to be compelling and interesting, but who knows where the line is? So tell us where the line is, and it's not going to be the same for all of you either. I may have a different line than you have, so who knows what it is? I just think we have to all consistently pursue better stuff, and if we if we just create stuff that people want to engage with, um, let's just make it better every single day, and we'll draw our own lines for different brands and different mediums. Ah, now I'm rambling and. Yeah, no, but I, I think your point is well taken. Nobody, you know, if you create something valuable or interesting for someone, they don't care if your logo is on it. They're just happy you made something cool and interesting. So, you know, I, I think the point is make good shit. Right? Yeah, yeah, We're yeah. going to put they're... that on a t-shirt and sell it. <laughs> yeah, it is. Really, that's all. It's all. Just make sure it doesn't suck. Yeah. Just don't suck. There, That's your mantra. Don't suck. Fair points. 
Hey everyone, I just want to take a moment out to thank one of the partners that we have that makes this show possible, WP Engine. You know, back in the days of dial-up, people would wait for websites to load, but attention spans are shorter than ever. Did you know that the average attention span has dropped to a mere 8 seconds? And for reference, the average attention span of a goldfish is only 9 seconds. So, you only have a short period of time to hook people on your website, and if half that time is spent waiting for the page to load, you are sure to lose customers. Beyond that, what do you do when your website goes down? Who do you call? Well, today's best businesses are running websites that load quickly and have virtually no downtime. In the event something does go wrong, the best businesses are back up and running in no time. That's why the best businesses trust WP Engine for hosting. If you're running a WordPress site like nearly 20% of the entire web, you owe it to yourself to upgrade your hosting to WP Engine. It's fast, it's secure, and their support is amazing. We use WP Engine at True Voice Media, and over the next 18 months, we're planning to move every single one of our sites to WP Engine. That's how good it is. Right now, WP Engine is offering two months free when you prepay for the entire year. And when you get to the site, look along the top of the page for additional discounts and offers. Go to truevoicemedia.com slash hosting to learn more about the best damn WordPress hosting on the web. All right, last question. I know we got to wrap this up, but last question. I'm, I'm curious your take on this because this is something you do day in, day out. We're looking forward to 2016, and, and I normally hate these sort of uh, make your prediction posts, but given that you're, you're so embedded in the world of content marketing and it's changed so much over the past couple of years and uh, paid promotions become so important, what are some of the things that you think are gonna, we're going to see in 2016? Do, or, or Actually, let me rephrase that. Do you think we're going to see any big changes in content marketing and promotion in 2016? or will we just kind of step-by-step step evolve? Um, I, well, I think we're going to step-by-step evolve. I think it'll be incremental things. But all it takes is one big event to completely change the, the fundamental principles that we all operate on. And, you know, I, I mean, it has been used to death, but you'll see why I'm using it in a, in a second. Oreo dunk in the dark? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's Classic just, and, I mean... Yeah, I mean, I hate talking about it just as much as the next person, but nobody was predicting that real-time or always-on marketing was going to be a big thing, right? Nobody was. And I don't know that they thought that, they, hey, we're going to create a whole new thought the leadership piece around real-time marketing. But when it happened, suddenly it's like, oh, now this is a thing because it was really, really successful. Now, I think what we're finding out now is like, oh, right, we all don't have to have a, a tweet around the Oscars if it's not relevant. You know, and now we're just adding to the clutter. So we've, we're kind of coming back to normal and we're, you know, we're correcting ourselves. But you never know. You, you, all it takes is one successful thing to create a whole sea of imitators out there. And I don't know that it was a, a, a strategic occurrence or something that evolved that we predicted – we just somebody lucked out somewhere and suddenly it became a thing and now we're, we're all trying to do that thing so the, the caveat is that yeah we, something may become a thing that nobody knows about because one brand manager got lucky somewhere and now we're all talking about it uh, um, so what do I think will occur I think the further erosion of church and state is going to occur I think um, brands are going to on one hand they're going to slowly start to turn um you know, they're gonna, you know, we saw L'Oreal has just started their own content studio. We saw Marriott create their own content studio. Brands are slowly going to start to bring things in-house where they are going to become publishers and they are going to become editors more than we've been talking about up to this point. Um, because a lot of that stuff, it just makes sense. Um, I think what we are going to see is we're going to see some changes in the content distribution. And I think we're going to see more partnerships of where we're sharing audiences with like-minded brands. I think we're going to see a decrease in the amount of community management that's happening. I think brands are getting tired of like saying thank you to every single post on Facebook. And and uh, and brands are going to slowly start to have a, a backbone, right? And go, there's some people we just don't care about. Screw off. Stop littering our Facebook page with your nasty comments and, and move on. Um, so I think we're going to see – we're just going to see it, people continue to grow up. Got it. Cool, man. Well, Ron, thank you so much for coming on the show. I think you are a blast to talk to. Likewise. Um, thanks, man. Appreciate that. Uh, tell people where they can go and be social with you, find out more about you, book you for speaking engagements, all that sort of good stuff. This is the benefit of having a first and last name that is only seven letters. 
So you can go to rontite.com. My Twitter is at rontite, Facebook slash rontite. Um, the agency is thetightgroup.com. You can check that out. And um, yeah, I'm, uh, feel free to to, to, uh, to connect and LinkedIn, Ron Tight. You know, it's just it's, it's all the same. Just Google Ron Tight. That's about it. But we'll put all that stuff in the show notes so people can find you and connect with you. Um, awesome. Thanks again for coming on the show, man. This was really, really cool. And uh, I hope we get a chance to do it again. Likewise. Thanks. Come on. Take care, everyone. Thanks for listening. Come back again. I'm getting some really kick ass guests. You've been listening to the True Voice Media Podcast. And you made it all the way to the end of the episode. I'm proud of you. But now that you're here, this is what we're going to need you to do. First of all, head on over to your favorite podcast platform and give us a rating. If you don't know where to start, go to truevoicemedia.com slash feedback. Next, if you're not yet a subscriber, it's time you fix that. Head over to truevoicemedia.com slash podcast to subscribe by iTunes, Stitcher, or email. If you really want to show us some love, visit our partners and sponsors who help make this show possible. I know the show feels free, but trust me, it's not. I sure ain't done publishing these episodes, so I sure hope you're not done listening. I'll see you on the next one. Take care.